Our topic today is the call of the heart, and I'm pleased to be a part of the Spring Renewal Program, a three-part message series that will lead to next Sunday's Easter experience. And the, the title of the series is Wisdom of the Heart. And a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Michelle helped us understand the research as well as the, the mystical foundations for uh, the heart and understanding that the brain is not actually the most powerful and intelligent part of our, of our being, our physical being. It is the heart. It is the heart. It's a spiritual, physical vortex that opens us up to great power. And her invitation was for us to absolutely uh, tap into the genius of the heart. Then last Sunday, Reverend Joshua Reverend Josh, he, he shared with us um, that we are the love that we seek. It's not a commodity out there. We are the love that we seek. And uh, what we get to do is overcome our objections, the ego's objections to love, its fear of love, and that we might then fulfill the possibilities of love within us. Now then, recognizing this very powerful center of the heart, the opening of which totally transformed my life in my early 30s. The question is, how does it call us to greater dimensions of living? Now, I am a banjo player, some of you may know, and what I've noticed of late is there's a good deal of banjo bashing that goes on <laughs> in various places that we tolerate with love and compassion. And uh, another example, which also solves a long-held riddle, uh, is in this cartoon from the far side that I share with you. So, you admit that this is indeed your banjo the police found at the scene, but you expect this jury to believe that you were never in the kitchen with Dinah? <laughs> so there it is, mystery solved. Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah strumming on the old banjo. Now we know. I thought of that also as this past week, uh, I, our, our former senior minister, um, whom I served after, Dr. Fred Vogt, a beloved mentor and friend. Uh, it was his birthday last week. And uh, I remembered that Fred always liked to challenge the congregation with this question. He said, if you were hauled into court and charged with being a science of minder, a religious scientist, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> yeah. Today is about manifesting clear evidence of the power of love at work in our lives, exuding from our hearts, and learning to discern and follow the call of the heart. Now, in the, the Christian calendar of Holy Days, this is a significant Sunday. It is dubbed Palm Sunday. It's a great opportunity to connect with the incredible teachings of that master teacher, who was challenging humanity to activate the power of the heart. And I believe that he was the greatest teacher and example of the open heart in life. He would say, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then he would say, and it seemed outrageous, but he would say, hey, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which spitefully use you. And ultimately he would say, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So in that Palm Sunday scenario, what we have called Palm Sunday. What was happening then was that Jesus had completed his, uh, his several year ministry in Galilee. And then he made his first visit to Jerusalem where for several months it is said that he taught and he healed there. Then he left and he journeyed to a small town called Ephraim uh, for three months of spiritual preparation. You see, he was very, very clear uh, of the challenges that before him, that were lying before him. He was very clear uh, about what was going on. You see, his fame had reached an epic all-time level. He was indeed the superstar that uh, the musical talks about. Uh, because recently he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. 
and he had become an uh, ever-increasing threat, an enormous threat to the power structures of his day. Nonetheless, six days prior to the Feast of the Passover, he made what's called the great decision to go back into Jerusalem anyway, knowing that it would surely mean his demise. But he went back anyway, and as he rode in on a borrowed donkey, receiving what in that day was a hero's welcome as the people brought out palm fronds and laid them on the road in front of them as they entered. And they were all yelling, Hosanna! And yet those very same people would in just a few short days be yelling, crucify him, crucify him. To me, this represents the clearest, most powerful demonstration of honoring and following the call, the mandate of the heart. Absolutely the most beautiful and powerful expression. He was absolutely showing us the power of courageously doing the bidding of spirit, the bidding of love, the bidding of the divine. It's, it was living in integrity with the truth that he was about. The heart calls each of us, maybe not to lay down our lives like that, but the heart calls to each of us. You see, the heart is our bridge into the higher self, or what could be called the Christ self, made in the image and after the nature and the likeness of God. And this higher self, this Christ self, is immersed in the infinite love and intelligence of our creative source. So our higher self is also permeable to the great ideas and the energies and the capacities of God itself. This is where, when we go to an open heart, it's where we step into an immediate experience of the divine. And we begin to realize the expanded capacities of our own being that we're intended to manifest. We're intended to grow into these capacities. And when we go to the heart center, get out of our heads and into our hearts, we come to know this. However, the practicality and the expediency of the ego or the worldly mind is so very often uh, allowed to obscure and overrule the call of the heart, the guidance of the spirit, or even the reliance upon heart in our life. Yet nonetheless, the heart continues to call to each one of us it calls to us. It calls us to our spiritual greatness and to our higher design as co-creators with God, co-creators of a really great life, co-creators of the kingdom of heaven on earth, not later, but now. Now. That's the call of the heart. Now, I know also that the heart calls each of us in unique ways. But I also believe that there are three heart callings that are universal to us all. That in one way or another, at one time or another, we sense and feel within us. And the first of these, the call of the heart, transcend your life-limiting fears. Our hearts know we're not fear-based beings. Our hearts know that we're commissioned to be emissaries of God, which is to be an emissary of love. That's what our heart knows. So the heart calls us to end our servitude to our fears. And heaven knows we pile up fear after fear after fear. Even infants, they say, have two fears, the fear of being dropped or the fear of loud noises. But then, of course, as, as the months and years creep on, we pile fear after fear after fear after fear on top of that until we're loaded down and fully ready to access any menu of fear necessary to stop us from being vulnerable, to, to, to being available, to, to slow the wheels of change that we think we can. It's this litany of fears that cause us to hide out in, in the illusion of a false security in our lives. And we, we begin to, what the Bible calls, grieve the spirit. Because we let fear be the determiner and the decider. And it puts the brakes on. And it enshrouds us in this life. And yet, 
there's an antidote, as it's also written in the Bible, perfect love casts out fear. Casts out fear. The call of the heart is to stop being a puppet of fear and become a master of fear. Now, fear is going to be with us in our life. To be a master of fear does not mean that you drive it out of your life, especially if you're living a dynamic life. You're going to have fear. You're going to have fear. But the master makes sure that fear is in the back seat, not the driver's seat. The master of fear knows that, as I wrote in my book in a chapter called This Fear is Friend, the master knows that fear is actually a friend reminding us we're not where our power is. And it's time to get back to our hearts. That's where we have the power to overwhelm the fear. That's where we can connect with our passion for our purposes, for what matters to us. That's where we gain the gift of courage to go ahead and do it afraid. Masterful living is we go to our heart when we're afraid. And we're no longer a puppet of that fear. We're still experiencing it. But we're overwhelming it with that passion, with that courage, and we go ahead doing what we need to do, being what we need to be. Now back to that Jerusalem experience for Jesus. So after presiding over uh, what was later to be called the Last Supper, Jesus went with his followers to the Garden of Gethsemane. (coughs) And there they slept and he prayed. And... He was afraid. There's little doubt of that. He was troubled, sorely troubled. And he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. And and we can relate. When there's something big before us, or or we seem to be threatened, but the heart is calling, and and we want to say, as Jesus did, hey, uh, Big Daddy, if there's another way than this... I'm on board. Um, And yet, as he very honestly and vulnerably proclaimed this, it's also reported, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. What a beautiful demonstration of calling out the fear and acknowledging it, but not letting it run the show and honoring the call of the heart in his life. Where is it time for you to let your greater resources of heart take you out of prisons of fear? I'll tell you about a man named Robert Smalls. Uh, He was born in uh, 1839 in Beaufort, South Carolina. He was a part of our uh, tragic history of enslavement of African Americans, and he was among them. In his youth, he was shipped to Charleston and given many jobs, but in the process of being near Charleston Harbor, he learned the ways of sailing, uh, calculating the water's depths and navigating that harbor. He became expert at it, and uh, in fact, he was the unofficial skipper of the Planter, which was a Confederate steamship. Now, he had a burning desire in his heart of hearts to to escape from enslavement in his life. And and he was self-taught to read and write and had these sailing skills. And he wanted a free life, but he was so afraid because he knew what happened to those who tried to escape that situation. Nevertheless, on May 13, 1862... Smalls sneaked his wife and three children onto the planter steamship while the the white officers were asleep. And he took command of a crew with 12 slaves. And then Smalls raised the Confederate flag and steamed through the harbor right past the other Confederate ships who really didn't give it another thought and sailed out into the Atlantic Ocean. And then when he was far enough out from the range of fire from the Confederate ships, he took that flag down and he flew the flag of truce. And then he brought the steamer right into the head of the Union fleet and surrendered the ship. And and then he said to his, his, quote, captors, he explained that the ship was a gift 
on behalf of all black Americans who were fighting to escape the physical and mental depravity of slavery. Well, news traveled and he became a hero. Lincoln brought him to the White House and honored him. Uh, he was then made a captain in the United States Navy and made the official captain of the planter, now a union ship. Later, he was elected to the Carolina Senate, and then he did five terms in the United States Congress. You got to think about the fear, though, but the possibility. Where in your life does your heart want to go? Where in your life is the opportunity for a greater freedom? Transcend your life limiting fears, the heart says. You'll get through it with the heart. Another calling of the heart is to unearth your unequaled gifts. Every one of us is a once in a universe person, unique expressions of the spirit, endowed with gifts and talents, many of which are not being accessed, are being held back for one reason or another. Longings of the heart to express what's special in you and in me. Now, these gifts and talents, they're the substance of what become the really beautiful dreams that can animate our lives. The dreams that are not a bunch of the shoulds that other people and, uh, and what we've been taught over the years, but the dreams that are authentic to our heart. But so often we're in alienation to what wants to be expressed as us. And the call of the heart is unearth these unparalleled, unequal gifts. I remember years ago, a very moving time of counseling with a man who had just about everything going for him ostensibly. I mean, he, had, he was very wealthy in his business, had a beautiful family, beautiful home and everything. But he was depressed, and he was finding himself sabotaging a lot of stuff. And he said, I don't want to blow this all up, but I don't know what. I just, I'm not happy. And we talked a long time, a number of sessions, and then he took our inner child journey, and all of that kind of catalyzed a realization he had one time in my office. He had a memory that when he was in his early teens, his grandfather had given him an art set. It was a beautiful brushed aluminum case, uh, and um, it had everything in it. It had watercolors and oils and the brushes and the knives and the palette. It was gorgeous. And he was so excited, and he found it, and he started using it. He was good at it, and he got incredible joy at it. But then his brother started teasing him, and then peers started teasing him and piling on as well. And then one day, his dad came home after losing his job, and yelled at this man, saying, quit this damn art and get out and get a part-time job to help the family. So he was just crushed, and he told me of the day that he went out into the backyard next to the garage, and he dug a hole, and he buried that art set. And he didn't do art since. And then as he shared that, he was sobbing. He said, I get it. I stopped doing what I really wanted to do. He got the message. And he told me later on that he actually went to that house, still in their family, dug up that art set. And it was pretty corroded by then. <laughs> but, it, but he didn't use it to actually do the art. He kept it around as a symbol to not do what he had done to himself ever again. And then he got back into art classes and he started painting and it started flourishing through him. And then he got into pottery and into sculpting. Then he did the outrageous. He quit his job, he packed up his family and they moved to Sedona and he rented a small storefront and he started selling his and other people's art. And I love the letter I got from him that said, I'm, I've never been happier. The store and my family were doing great. And he said, if you ever get a chance, tell my story and tell people, don't bury your dreams and don't bury your gifts and if you have go dig them up <laughs> that's a call of the heart gang finally a universal call of the heart is to shine your healing light 
shine your healing light. We humans are an interesting bunch of beings. We've been given the creative consciousness, which in miniature is the same consciousness moving in the mind of God that created all form from the inner to the outer, from the idea to the form. And we're given access to that very process to master that we might reveal our spiritual possibilities. And yet we misuse this ability and we create, uh, we create a lot of beauty, but we also see what's going on in the world and we create a lot of travesty and a lot of suffering. And then there are those who say, well, why isn't God taking care of this? If God is love and God is everywhere, and God, why isn't God healing this? And I, I believe that if the spirit of the divine could speak to us, it would say, I didn't create this stuff. You did. And I've given you the wherewithal and the answer already. And it's here in the heart. Shine the heart, step into what you're designed to be, and let's join hands and let's create an answer. And let's resolve this. It's the call to shine our healing light. <laughs> the great teacher said, hey, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine. He said, I've, I've shown you what's possible. I'm shown, I didn't come here to be the great exception, but an example to you. This is what's possible. I've told you that the kingdom of heaven isn't later. It's not up there or over there. The kingdom of God is within you, I've said. And I've told you the things that I have done shall you do, and even greater things shall you do. The divine is telling us that. And now, as we awaken to the power of the heart, we gain the capacity to do just that. An organization I helped found uh, quite a while ago called the Association for Global New Thought. We had a lot of conferences. His, His Holiness the Dalai Lama was at three. And uh, there was one we had uh, with young spiritual and social leaders. We were lifting them up and connecting them. And one of these uh, young people was uh, a man from India named Nipun Mehta. Nipun Mehta. And now he's gone on. He's got uh, a website where he publishes a lot of articles about what's going on productively in our world, and he's got a blog and all this good stuff. Nipun has coined a term that I really love, heartivism, heartivism. It's activism energized and guided by compassion and kindness. A lot of people have causes, and they're worthy, but they're angry activists who unwittingly perpetuate the deep foundation of division and, uh, and, and in a way sabotage their very efforts. But Nipun's talking about making a difference, but making sure that it is inspired by and energized by the heart, and that it is of compassion and kindness. And the big change agents like Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., they demonstrated this, this heart of ism. This is a capacity not just for them, but for every one of us. It's time in our world for us to step forward in this way. You see, the heart of us doesn't take sides. You say, oh, I'm going to get on this side and battle with this side. The heart of us says, there's a bigger truth around that I can draw around both sides. And I can bring out energy and healing because heart of ism is about oneness, the oneness of all beings, regardless of all the ways we divide. It's oneness. And heart of ism is about what's the higher answer than the two sides or the many sides in conflict. And that's what we need. Oh, we need that. That was Jesus' way. He didn't go into Jerusalem uh, to defeat the Roman authorities or to supersede even the Pharisees and Sadducees of his own tradition. He said, I'm teaching something bigger than both and can include both. And that's the presence of God now. The kingdom of heaven within, the Christ within, your hope of glory. And that's what we get to be about. The amazing power of compassion and kindness we underestimate. Let me tell you about a man named Mac McKinney. His picture is going to be up on the screen here any second. You may have heard his story. He's from Muncie, Indiana. A Marine Corps veteran, he had many years of serving, rounds of service, the last of which was in the Afghanistan conflict. When he finally uh, accepted his honorable discharge, he left the service as a very wounded, emotionally wounded human being. 
He carried an enormous load, he admits, of shame and guilt for some of the things he did and what was going on, and a lot of PTSD. And he was just barely making do as he came home. And then in 2002, we had the 9-11 experience, and that enraged Mac. And it boiled and seethed within him. In 2009, he concocted a plan that he wanted to kill as many Muslims as he could at the Islamic Center in Muncie, Muncie, Indiana. So he planned to detonate a homemade bomb on Friday afternoon when the congregants regularly were filling uh, the place. And he, is, by his own admission, says, I was hoping for at least 200 or more. Gone. Now, based on his training, he knew the key to this mission was for him to do reconnaissance beforehand. So he decided to just walk into the mosque. And one day he did. And he didn't look anything like most of the people who were there. And they were, he was obviously a stranger. But he was shocked to the core by the degree of love and patience and kindness that was lavished upon him. He was absolutely shocked to the core. He said, I was hoping... No, he said, the, the more time I spent around them, the more I started to change. One family even took him into their home and fed him on several occasions, continuing to lavish kindness upon him. Something began to shift in Mac. And over about eight weeks, he changed his mind, and all the hatreds and the plans to hurt dissolved out of his heart. And he says, they showed me what true humanity is about. He couldn't get enough of it. He kept going there. It was healing. And then he started studying the true essence of Islam, which, like the many great faith paths, ultimately teaches love. And he decided he had to become a Muslim, which he did. And he continued his deepening and his healing, making amends where he could. For a couple of years, he, or a couple of terms, he served as president of the mosque several years later. And now he travels across the country uh, teaching about his own journey from hate to understanding, his journey to the activated heart. And uh, this story is the basis of a short film you may be aware of called Stranger at the Gate. It was recently nominated uh, for the best documentary short film at the recent Academy Awards, and Malala Yousafzai uh, was a part of the production. Uh, the, she was an executive producer. Um, and, and may we take this in and just own the power of an activated heart, the power of transcending the differences and the appearances, the power of unconditional kindness to be healing in our lives. And you may say, well, that's just an isolated incident. It's only isolated because it's only used in isolated incidents. It needs to be a universal thing. And guess what? We're it. We're called. Your heart calls, or you wouldn't be here. And it's the key to living a great life. Kindness. Shining our light. One of Erica's friends, a Sufi Muslim lady, Salima Sanford, writes, Become kinder with every hour, for every hour takes you closer to your departure. We've got this day. Who knows if we've got tomorrow? But we've got this day to go to our power, to hear the call of the heart, to transcend life-limiting fears, the call of the heart to say, unearth those unequaled gifts. And moreover, the call of the heart, shine your healing light. Shine your healing light. I tell you, we honor that call of the heart, gang. And we will absolutely be stepping into a new dimension of meaningful, happy, powerful living. We'll be stepping into our higher design, our spiritual commission to be healers, to be channels, to be those who create the kingdom of heaven on earth. It's a life well lived. Let's claim it. Join me in a, a prayer together. Let a deep breath 
move through your entire being and further relax you as we gather in this vortex of love, my high church. And may we now quiet the mind and move our awareness to the heart center. Perhaps if I've spoken, you've already sensed it quickening. Let it happen now, if not. Sense that your heart, by just your gentle awareness placed upon it, is warming. Lifting you beyond the world of circumstances and effects. Lifting you, transporting you beyond problems and circumstances. Moving you with its light energy into the kingdom of at one moment, into the vast infinite love of the divine ever holding the world and all of us in its embrace proclaiming to each and every one of us thou art my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Let this hard energy permeate you, reconnecting you with your birthright and your greatness. Just know this heart, this love is my highest guide. This heart knows what my mind hasn't even discovered yet. This heart of mine accesses the ideas, the possibilities, the power, the light, the love of God. My precious heart, I stand strong in this heart and I rise above anything that's going on and I dedicate myself to living from this place, not just visiting occasionally, but living from this essence that I'm experiencing right now. This heart energy pours through me, absolving me of my past, easing the fears of the future and bringing me into the glory of love now. And to it I surrender and allow new inspiration. Feel that. Allow the healing activity throughout my body. Feel that. And knowing you can't contain this, I give thanks that this vibrates now from me and that this whole place is vibrating in this field, a very powerful field, the healing energy. And we give thanks for the healing of mind, body, and experiences, emotions, right here, right now, as we lavish ourselves in the peace, the presence, and the love of God. And now knowing that our heart of ism calls us to live this in the world, we prepare by envisioning the love that transcends the differences and the conflicts and that can reveal a higher possibility in the midst of them. And we allow this vibration to be, go beyond this place and move into our community, into our city, and most importantly, into our nation. That a rising wave of our readiness for something higher than the continued lesser conflicts to birth itself. And we stand for that. We participate in the revealing of that. And in this vibrancy, may we accept peace and well-being for all peoples everywhere, for all sentient beings and for all life forms upon this planet. For love is the great healer and revealer, centered in every one of us. Thank you, Spirit, for this healing truth. We not only accept it, but we live it and express it. And we know we're doubly and manifoldly blessed. We let it be so. And so it now is. Amen.